Good morning, folks. We have uh, several folks that have continued to join the call. Thank you for joining us the day after the the, uh, the last uh, 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 great holiday before school starts or barely started for most folks. So nice to have you with us. I, I hope you enjoyed a, a long four-day or three-day weekend. It's good to have you with us. Um, also very happy to have a guest speaker today. This is our monthly training that we hold with the NEMSIS uh, Technical Assistance Center. I'm I'm the principal investigator for the NEMSIS TAC that's here at the University of Utah. And uh, our monthly trainings are often associated with either the mechanics or the workings of NEMSIS. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Fire Chief Bruce Evans with us here today. Um, we've been talking for a number of months about the uh, many opportunities that uh, uh, bill money, uh, the, bi uh, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, uh, monies that have been made available, the funds that have been made available through uh, the Department of Transportation. And uh, uh, Bruce Chief uh, 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 Bruce Evans has been able to uh, access some of that money in the Upper Pine River uh, Fire Protection District uh, uh, in Colorado. So we're excited to have him. The idea that he can talk um, uh, to you about what they have done to access those funds and perhaps give you some ideas about how you might also be able to make a use of SS4A funds. So uh, um, with the introduction, uh, Chief, I'd love to be able to turn it over to you. Okay, well, great. Um, thank you, Clay, and uh, for the rest of the NEMSIS team to invite me in to speak about the SS4 and the Safe Streets uh, program. Um, so I would tell you a couple things. Um, I, I'll start with just a little bit of history about how we got involved with the SS4 system and uh, with NISA's grant program. So I would tell you, number one, um, we, uh, so my, if you look at my bio, I think uh, some people know that I was the media past, pre I'm the media past president now of NAMT, but during my two year term as the president of NAMT, you know, you have an opportunity to meet and uh, hear information that comes from major players in the US government, of which one of those was GAM, uh, that we were fortunate to have one of our DC meetings with. And GAM had kind of rolled out what was going on with the um, Senator or uh, Secretary Buttigieg's plan for the highway traffic safety uh, programs and that this SS4 grant would be coming out. And at that time, there were public comments that were offered um, that you they wanted to know a little bit more about the rulemaking as this money started to come down. So NEMT did submit uh, rulemaking uh, suggestions in uh, to the public comments, and we were focused mainly on a part of the grant uh, called um, post-crash care. And as we put this together and started looking at the grant program, so just real quickly, um, you know, the Safe Streets program is divided into two programs. Uh, one of them is to write a safety plan for a section of roadway that might um, go through your community. And the other one is what they call an implementation grant. So the first round of grants for the safety program and to write the program um, is about $200,000 in, um, in uh, NHTSA money and from DOT. And I would tell you that the um, that's the gate key, as many grants are, to open up further grant money, which the implementation plans can uh, use up to $5 million. So um, you can see where we were going with this when we put in for the grant opportunity. And, and we're the only fire-based organization out of 300 and some grants that got awarded um, to, to achieve that. And, and I think actually we're probably the only fire EMS organization um, to achieve one of those grants. So what we were, what the motivation was behind applying for it is one, just the, the concern for safety on a section of roadway that transects our fire district. But we we're also wanted to control the narrative on an implementation plan. So uh, to do that, we had to get control of the safety plan, and we had to write it. So, for example, um, there's five or six pillars that um, have to be um, addressed when you write a safety plan in the SS4 grant. You know, safe people, safe vehicles, post-crash care um, is just one of those pillars, but it's the one that really speaks to us um, as an EMS organization. 
And certainly the Nemesis folks, you guys are you guys are collecting all the information on injuries and those post crash care initiatives that could be in a safety plan really rely on uh, that data set to to uh, effectively illustrate what the crashes are and what kind of injuries the crashes are producing. Um, even to the extent of some things that might be seasonal, for example, um, you know, is the, the data set telling us that there's more motorcycle crashes with more serious injuries in, say, March or April, um, because that's when the snow melts and they haven't cleaned the roads and it hasn't rained yet. And there's sand and other things that are a little bit more hazardous to motorcycles. Um, or is there maybe a cluster around back to school or the holidays? Um, on roads. And um, it's interesting. Uh, the other day, I was looking at some data that came from uh, NHTSA, and uh, we had a rollover. That was about four o'clock in the morning, a pretty significant extrication, a vehicle rolled down an embankment, the uh, lady was pinned in the car where it was upside down in the brush. And we had to chainsaw our way in to get to her. And just looking at, um, you know, her story was is that she was on her way to work. Um, she's a shift worker. She was fatigued. And going back and kind of looking at NHTSA already being able to, um, to uh, stratify some data for what is a drowsy driver and when, when does a drowsy driver go off the road. Statistically, between uh, midnight and 6 a.m., or there is a little cluster that's in the afternoon. Um, those are probably uh, accumulated with circadian rhythms. And then typically it's a single driver um, and there's no evidence of braking. And um, most of them, like 80% of them occur on rural roads or highways. Um, so there, that's kind of the big three for a sleepy driver, um, which I think is uh, fascinating numbers that, um, again, probably come out of a little bit of your data sets that you're managing and then uh, maybe some FARS data, you know, the fatal accident reporting system data and other highway traffic safety data. So, so they're just an incredible place there to start doing analysis on um, some crash data. But uh, like I said, what we're after on this is to control the narrative and focus on post-crash care. And some of the things that we're looking at there, so the grant also required you to have a discussion about um, and again, it's Secretary Buttigieg, so he has his, uh, he's running, it's his ship, and he has some things that he um, is uh, passionate about. Uh, DEI uh, information, um, carbon footprints, and, uh, and diversity. And um, so you, you do have to answer those questions after you receive the grant. Um, there's a statement of work and a contract that comes with the money. And there's some appendixes that have to be addressed um, that the secretary would, would prefer that um, each of the agencies that's participating with this money address those items. Now, I will tell you, uh, we used a large language model, uh, otherwise known as ChatGPT, to answer those questions. Now, um, somebody may say, well, that's cheating, but it really isn't because we, we still have to proofread those. And you can't just plug things into chat GPT and then cut and paste. Um, it does require some amount of administrative oversight to make sure that chat GPT is writing the right thing. So while it does the work for you, you're still responsible to proofread it. So the DEI statement, uh, the carbon footprint statement, and the um, uh, the diversity and equity statements um, were all done by chat GPT. And when we turned those into NHTSA, they said they look fantastic. And again, like I said, we did have to proofread them, but um, the initial work in answering the questions, cut and pasting the questions out of the appendix into the large language model um, was able to generate those narratives. And then we did add some things in the narrative, like the chat GPT wouldn't know, like, for example, carbon footprint. So one of the things we're after on post-crash care, and this is certainly a nemesis um, data set is how often extrication equipment is used. And for example, right now, uh, there's a lot of agencies that are preferring to go to the battery powered extrication equipment, um, as compared to the power plant ext extrication equipment that utilizes a fossil fuel. 
uh, versus a lithium ion battery. And uh, the technology now has um, finally achieved that position now where the battery powered extrication equipment is just as efficient as the fossil fuel uh, powered equipment. And, um, you know, so in post crash care uh, to meet the secretary's goals, um, could, you know, one of the things that we're after on this is to be able to replace a series of extrication tools up and down this corridor that we've identified um, with battery powered equipment. And, um, and then some of the other things we're looking at in the post crash care piece of this is uh, the use of whole blood. Um, Colorado has a statewide initiative now um, to try to move whole blood into the field. Uh, a lot of that based on what we've learned out of San Antonio and out of the Dallas Metroplex and just the really amazing results that some of the agencies are getting with administration of whole blood in the field. The other thing we're looking at in the post-crash care realm is um, trying to make it, the roadway a little bit safe, safer for the providers that are out there uh, attending to people that are in car crashes. So, for example, um, is this, uh, you know, do we start talking about the use of the traffic incident management system and providing more education for that? Um, are we starting to talk a little bit about other uh, deployable things that we can do to reduce the risk of a car coming up on an accident scene and striking a provider? And, you know, for example, sign deployable signs or uh, attenuator trucks or what some people call a scorpion truck. Um, now, we know that there there's a lot of fatalities that occur with roadway workers. Uh, matter of fact, um, one of the things that um, we put in the background on this um, application going into the Safe Streets program was that our neighboring community over in Pagosa Springs had a fatality two years ago where a flagger was hit and killed um, by a motorist. Now, uh, knock on wood, we've been pretty safe with the uh, first responders, um, but the highway workers have certainly taken the brunt of uh, being struck on the roadway. Um, so the area that we looked at, just to kind of give you a little details about our grant, um, like I said, it's a it's a program grant. So we're writing the safety program for a section of US 160, um, and we're outside our boundaries of the fire district. We're covering the area from Wolf Creek Pass, which is essentially where the Continental Divide is, going west all the way to the Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and Utah border at the Four Corners. Now, that gave us a couple of other um, benefits and in, uh, increased our competitiveness in the grant. One, because um, we uh, we selected the, the amount of roadway that also covers a little bit of tribal land. And there are bonus points in the evaluation process for uh, making sure that you're partnered with, a, uh, for example, an indigenous group um, or tribal properties or tribal lands. Um, and so we do have a section of roadway that that we're looking at as part of this plan. And, you know, we'll be looking to provide, you know, extrication equipment and and some other alternatives in the uh, in the plan uh, to one of the tribal fire departments that's in the in the mix with us on this. So if you haven't traveled through southwest Colorado, US 160 is an extremely dangerous road. Um, it is two lanes, high speed. Um, there are very little passing lanes. Some of the passing lanes are pretty short. Um, it's curvy and it uh, it gets a lot of traffic. It's the major arterial through Southwest Colorado um, going east to west. It gets a lot of truck traffic. Um, most of the groceries and fuel and other critical supplies to keep society running come in through 160. Um, many of them coming up from Texas when we talk about fuel trucks. Um, when we talk about grocery trucks, um, the the uh, number of trucks that comes in just to supply the food chain from Denver um, is pretty significant. We get surprisingly very little up from Albuquerque, uh, building supplies mainly. Um, so that that two lane section of road that is curvy gets not only a lot of tourist traffic, but it gets a lot of commercial traffic uh, that comes up and down. And again. Um, there's a variety of different safety issues that um, all I think the data set could help with. So, for example, uh, there's a section of 160 in my uh, fire protection district that has some of the highest number of animal strikes um, in the country. 
And even though they've gone in and done some mitigation work to try to put, uh, you know, try to herd certain animals, you know, through underpasses or overpasses, um, they don't behave. Um, interestingly enough, um, we pulled some data off the data set a few years ago when we were looking at some things for the state of Colorado EMS. And surprisingly, 75% of the ambulance crashes that occur in the state of Colorado are, am are animal strikes. And, you know, our EMS division um, and our EMS department in Colorado did a great job of, um, you know, now funding uh, like infrared detectors and heads up displays and um, other, you know, things to avoid crashes for the ambulances in part of our grant program. So um, that's just one example of data that's pretty good um, of making decisions of uh, for EMS providers and keep them safe. So, you know, I think in the future, you know, the, it's, I would say that there's also a couple of sets of data that are maybe outside the realm of NEMSIS that you probably should be aware of. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we looked at very closely and it was required on the grant is the number of fatalities. Now, uh, the number of near misses or how we define uh, fatality, you know, these are obviously when it comes to the FARS data or the fatal accident reporting data that law enforcement does. Um, the FARS data, you know, really is about people that are dead at the scene or die, you know, relatively soon of going to the hospital. Um, the ones that die weeks later, you know, from, say, maybe end organ failure from being in shock too long or um, that have a complication where they get an infection post-surgery, um, we're not sure that we're tracking those that well. And uh, whether that becomes the big picture of how expensive it is uh, for these crashes to occur on a section of road. So the FARS data and relating to the FARS data, um, you know, and I know that term relational databases, everybody wants that. You know, we want uh, we want one database to be talking to the other so that we can get, a, get you know, a longitudinal assessment of the patient. The other thing that's out there that um, I, I would tell you, frankly, I was shocked at and I shouldn't have been, is that uh, as soon as we got the grant awarded to us, we were contacted by GM's Intelligent Vehicle Division. And I know we've talked about this before in uh, many discussions about EMS data, that the future is being able to have vehicles and now even potentially, um, you know, the Apple Watch telling us if the person either in the vehicle or wearing the watch has had an injury. Um, like, for example, the other day, I know that uh, we had some people out uh, kayaking and they were wearing one of their watches and um, the watch alerted them and asked them if they needed help. And uh, I, I thought that was stunning. And, you know, we're even hearing from, you know, the some of the people about, you know, if they're immobile or if the watch detects a ground level fall or a fall of any significance that the watch will activate some of the EMS. Um, potentially, uh, the watch could be also monitoring your heart rate and, and be able to summon if there's cardiac emergency or even a syncopal episode or a slowing of your heart rate. Now, so GM calls us, um, they offer up some data, I'm meeting with them actually this afternoon and uh, ask them to chop the data into um, kind of areas that we've identified. We've split up our grants so that we're covering kind of unique hazards all the way across the corridor. And they're grabbing vehicle data that, uh, frankly, I'm a little bit stunned that it's being collected. So, for example, um, a GM, a modern GM vehicle will be able to tell if you braked um, too hard, if you um, are wearing a seatbelt, if there's other people in the vehicle that are not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, they'll be able to tell um, if the vehicle um, you know, goes over the fog line, which is that white line on the side of the road. And you know that many vehicles will kind of uh, alert you to kind of get back on the road. Um, I've even seen some of the vehicles alert people to say, um, you know, maybe you need to pull over or you should consider taking a break. I've seen that data pop up on dashboards. Um, so let's just say, for example, somebody's trans transversing the 160 corridor, uh, say from Denver to Durango. And, uh, you know, they've been they took off late after work and they get a little drowsy and they nod their head down and then, um, you know, go over the rumple strips and the vehicle senses that and alerts them to get back into their lane. Well, that's not a crash, but it's a near miss. And 
one of the things that we're going to be able to put in our plan, which I think is going to be cutting edge, is that that uh, GM is able to capture some of these near misses. Um, you know, and as a student and a writer of uh, crew resource management and situational awareness, having the ability to identify crashes that could have happened uh, versus crashes that did happen um, is really a phenomenal uh, piece of engineering for our safety plan. Um, so as a drowsy drivers, where are they drowsy at? The first part of our um, our project area or the last part of the project area, the middle of the project area. But some of the information that's coming off the intelligent vehicle design, I think there's more to come, um, is really incredible. And and like I said, I think it tells a story of near misses. Um, and, you know, when we start really getting into prevention issues um, with these grants and writing safety plans, and, you know, like I said, one of the pillars, you know, there's five pillars out of the, um, or six pillars out of the um, Safe Streets program, that one of them is safer people, um, you know, and how do we get, uh, you know, uh, how do we get the really good data about safer people? Well, again, those near miss pieces of data are, I think, are just a really incredible nugget of information to come off there. I'm not sure that we have any place in the Nemesis um, data that really addresses near misses, but I think the future is, is that when these events do occur, and we do get a crash and it does summon a 911 response. Is there a way for the intelligent vehicle data to be transmitted through the dispatch CAD and then have the dispatch CAD immediately load that information into the EPCR of then which we've got it captured? And hopefully it's going up to the state and then up to the, the tech center in, uh, in Salt Lake. So um, I think that. Data is always fascinating. I know there's kind of a small number of data geeks that are out there that uh, we all resonate with, you know, the fascination of this information. Um, but it, it was very critical for us when we did, you know, in applying for the Safe Streets grant, you do have to go in and get your data on the number of crashes, the number of fatal crashes. Um, like I said, they haven't drilled down um, excessively into injuries um, and looking at the years of potential life lost or the cost of these injuries. But I, I think that that's probably the next generation of the grants. And certainly, as the grants are open right now, um, just so people are in, intimately aware of the requirements of the grant, um, one of the things that was nice about it um, is that it's designed to go to local organizations and not to um, state or federal organizations. So I think that's key that, um, you know, trying to get local people to engage their data and get local people to look at sections of their roadway that are extremely dangerous and uh, generating a lot of call volume and certainly putting responders at risk is huge. So as the next round of these grants open up, and again, there's lots of money in there, um, and I think that the big piece of this is to understand that it's a two-part grant system. There has to be a safety plan in place. And then, um, you know, once the safety plan is in place, then you can go back for more money to implement um, and do an implementation grant to implement some of those things that you wrote down in your safety plan. So I know I, I've talked a lot. I, I was kind of under the assumption I had about 20 minutes. So I'm half, happy to answer any questions that the group may have. Keith Evans, this is Clay. Great presentation. Thank you. And wow, that, a very creative in regards to the EMS related aspects of of your grant that were funded. <clears throat> I um uh just very impressive. A couple of questions. Um um did you receive uh did you receive comments back in regards to your submission uh asking you to reevaluate or provide more information regarding a topic cuz I was I was incredibly impressed that uh, the reviewers of this grant were, were, uh, I, I, for example, understood and then were interested in, for example, uh, of uh, the fossil footprint and and why you could be looking for new extrication uh, kind of equipment uh, uh, that's lithium battery powered, right? I mean, that's 
That's impressive. Um, um, did they need any further explanation or come back with other questions to you? Uh, they did. I think we wrote the grant pretty well for it. And again, knowing that, you know, and I get this question all the time from my board of directors. So, you know, should we hire a grant writer for you because you're doing so many of these? And I would tell you that, you know, and I probably should have told, talked about this at the beginning of the presentation. So Upper Pine is a super rural EMS provider. So um, we got 282 square miles that we cover, uh, about 12,000 people, 12,700 permanent residents there. We get a big influx of tourists in the summer. Um, and, and I cover that 282 square miles with eight to 10 people a day. And, you know, the one thing, uh, so we're a pretty lean organization as a rural provider. I think we have a, an incredible amount of luxuries. We're about a 4.2 to $4.8 million operation on a day, you know, on an annual basis. And, you know, to date we've brought in probably $10 million in grant money. Um, and that's in the 11 years that I've been here. Now, I would tell you that, um, you know, when you're writing these grants, you know, it's it's not rocket science. Uh, it's, you know, you got to read the NOFO or the Notice of uh, Funding Opportunity. And, and then you got to write to those answers. Um, and, you know, EMS is notorious for chasing bouncing red balls, uh, you know, and I'm just as bad as everybody else, you know, that a good call comes in or, you know, some other thing distracts you from this. And, um, but it, you know, a good grant writer has to have the discipline to follow the request in the NOFO. And, and you know, and looking at that section in the NOFO that says what is eligible to be funded. Um, and then, you know, having, you know, so good grant writing is uh, a combination of following the rules in the NOFO and then having some creativity for the solutions that, the the eligible funding sources are looking to to have there so um, looking at post crash care um you know there's a lot of things that we could be doing to improve post crash care um i know there's still a big debate over scene time but i'm still a big believer that you know 10 minutes is for critical trauma is you should be off the scene 10 minutes or less um, the whole blood we know that that is making an incredible difference if we're able to get whole blood in rural settings, especially rural Colorado, where there's a lot of uh, motor vehicle crash fatalities. Um, and that could be a game changer, big game changer. Um, and then, you know, protecting uh, uh, first responders on the roadway. I mean, I've been participating in the National EMS Memorial Service for over a decade. And you always look and see that, you know, there's probably five you know, sometimes a little bit more, but probably somewhere between three and five people. And same thing in the fire service between five and uh, right around five people killed every year when they're struck in the in the roadway and, uh, you know, providing care or there, um, you know, there's a, a one sad case in uh, Virginia about somebody going over, go over, over a bridge trying to jump out of the way of an oncoming uh, crash. Um, you know, and I, I would tell you that I was influenced by that early in my career. I was at the Wisconsin State EMS Association meeting, and one of the keynotes there was a guy that, that had both his lower legs amputated when he was struck uh, by a car while he was loading a patient in the back of a gurney or loading a patient in the back of an ambulance. And um, that was a very moving uh, presentation. And after that, you know, I've always been kind of a, a zealot about uh, roadway safety and making sure at least my crews are protected or if I'm working a scene like that, that we're uh, conscientious about what's going on on the road. So I think, you know, back to your question about, um, you know, the the key things in that and whether um, the uh, the grant evaluators had a full understanding of that, um, probably not. But again, the way it was written and explained in the in the grant application, I, I, I think they got educated on it. And I think uh, there's probably a lot of people at NHTSA that are grant evaluators that don't understand that the evolution that's coming with battery powered tools. And again, the, there's a lot of fire departments that probably are a little skeptical of that, but if you've been someplace and tried out that equipment, you know, it's just as good as the battery powered stuff or the uh, fossil fuel powered stuff. Okay, great, great. I'm going to ask one quick follow-up question. Thanks, uh, Chief Evans. And clearly, um, 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 we'd all would all like to have you know someone like you that has been successful with grant writing and kind of mastered that to be 
to be associated with our group. That would be incredibly valuable. So uh, kudos to you. Uh, um, you talked about you talked about this stretch of road, right? Uh, where this grant um, is concentrated, and and you described it. You know, it's curvy. It's it's dangerous. It's fast speed. It's two lane. Um, um, did you have to provide, or did you find data right uh, from Nemesis or other sources from uh, from codes or from uh, using uh, police reports that that provided some uh, 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 kind of uh, I guess would it be evidence right that there's that there's really an issue here to be addressed and how did you how did you prove that in the minds of the reviewers hey this this really is a part of our country that needs a special attention. So, you know, um, number one, I would tell you, um, you know, the attention deficit disorder crowd that is now part of everything, um, it's good to provide a map. So we did provide a lot of visuals. We, you know, we we did get access to the, um, to the crash data, uh, mainly off the FARS information, and off of some other NHTSA data sets that were available through the state of Colorado and uh, through the fed, um, through the federal agency. Um, as we went in and looked at those, um, we we also you know you can generate maps off of that stuff. So we did um, you know, and it's just really a, a matter of you know spending some time on the database where you know that you know. And gosh, we've struggled with this, and you know, my forty years at EMS, you know, we went from you know, paper charts and then putting paper information in for QI issues. Now you're doing everything electronically and um, it's great going in on the front end, but we're still struggling on the back end to get good reports and it, things that are visual that you can see well. And and I think the evolution of that is certainly, you know, coming. Um, you know, ESO has been really out there on the forefront of doing some of that stuff. But the um, the ability to generate pictures and show sections of road where, you know, you have the fatal accident um, on a map, I think is critical. Um, so we did get access to all those. And then I would tell you the other big challenge on this, it was a newer database that I've never been into, is one of the things that was critical on the application for the grant was the economic uh, diversity or the low income or um, what we would consider financially at risk neighborhoods along the along the roadway that we were we were targeting. So you had to go into in uh, the grant actually provides the link for this, but you had to go into some of the uh, economic data, and you had to um, generate um, census tract parcels along the roadway that. Uh, where you could determine what the average income was and what the poverty level was. And, and in addition to what, um, you know, what kind of diversity is along the roadway. And those all came out of economic databases. But like I said, the, the nice part about um, having to go in and grab that stuff is that in the NOFO, um, they do provide a link to where you can go grab that information. Um, and, and that's not something that we, we always get a chance to do with EMS data. Um, I think we all know the neighborhoods that we run more calls in, um, but we really know that. And is it really tied to income? Because um, we know that there's probably some low-income neighborhoods that we don't run a lot of calls in, that people are pretty self-sufficient. Um, and then there's other neighborhoods that might be average incomes. Um, and then, you know, again, what's the question about the um, average age and the economic diversity of those things? And it goes back to, you know, my, you know, what I think we all struggle with when we are managing databases is how do you get these databases to relate? You know, how do you get one to talk to the other and, and be able to form columns and charts that uh, pull from two databases? Um, and the grant does require not only do you go through and find where the crashes are, but the grant did require that you go in and find this economic data and this diversity data that is along the corridor. Um, and that's not something that we're normally used to doing. But like I said, the advantage to this particular grant is they provide the link. The website's pretty easy to get into. Um, it's pretty easy to navigate. 
And um, it, I, I consider it kind of a modern database where um, it has pull downs and it can generate uh, it can generate maps and it can generate census tracts for you pretty easily. Um, and just by moving the cursor around and identifying the location versus having to enter uh, numerical fields. Thanks, Chief Evans. Very helpful. Uh, uh, Mike asked a question in the chat. Um, what type of content is included in the safety plan? So that's the other great thing about the safety plan is it's a template. Um, so if you once you get uh, it, or if you want to go peruse around the SS4 website, um, there is a safety plan um, and it's a document that you just have essentially have to fill out. Um, it's not like you have to uh, generate original content. They have some specific questions and areas, especially the pillars in the highway traffic safety plan, um, the national highway safety plan um, that you have to address. And like I said, one of those, the pillar that resonates with us most, and we'll, we'll get to all the other ones too when we answer the plan, but is that post-crash care piece. And you know, I'm just a big advocate for the po uh, for EMS grabbing these plans because in, historically I've, I've had highway traffic safety grants in the past where we've done things like, you know, seatbelt awareness stuff um, with that money or, you know, I have bought extrication equipment when I was in Nevada with some of the highway traffic safety money there, backboards back in the day when backboards were a thing. And, um, and then uh, we, we've done a program called Every 15 Minutes, which some people may be familiar with, where you stage a mock crash at a high school right before prom. And you, you go through the thing of the EMS response and you take it all the way up to the funeral um, in the auditorium for one of the, the students that volunteers to be a victim, which has been funded by highway traffic safety money. So um, this one is a little different in the fact that like I said, there's a template they have to fill out for the safety plan that comes from NHTSA, and you just got to follow through with it, maybe put some original or creative ideas into each of the categories, but um, the the questions and the sections that have to be answered are, are kind of already in the template for you. You just got to fill it in with some creativity and some actionable items that you think you can do. Like, for example... Um, I came down 160 yesterday from Durango, um, coming up here to Breckenridge where we're doing a hazmat conference. And, um, I just was looking along the roadway to see what, uh, was fair game for me to document. And I got to Pagosa Springs and people were using the crosswalks there, but they were grabbing flags out of the crosswalks to cross the road. So they're carrying a flag from one side of the road to the other. Now, originally I would have told you, I thought that that would kind of be a really seriously people are using the flags. Um, but everybody I saw crossing the roadway in two crosswalks in Pagosa that were over 160 from, say, restaurant areas to, you know, parking areas, everybody used the flags. Um, and it was impressive to see that. So, um, you know, what, do we extend the flag concept a little further down the highway corridor? It's another example of that. So that, you know, that's back to one of the pillars that's in there about safer people. Like I tell you, there's five or six uh, pillars in the highway safety program. One of them is post-crash care, but the other one is safer vehicles. Um, there's another one that's safer people. So if the people are actually using those flags, it's something to be noted and and then maybe um, expanded on. So, so again, this is a, a good grant from the standpoint that um, you, you're, you know, they don't allow you to stray too far off the plan um, because they're giving you a template. Thank you, Chief Evans. Others have questions for Chief Evans? All right, uh, Chief Evans, thank you so much for the presentation. Incredibly helpful in regards to those who may be who may be thinking of writing to this opportunity or to others that are made available through the BIL money. Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Sounds good. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can end for today. Yeah, and again, I, I think, you know, the cube always can produce some fascinating things. And, um, you know, I think you guys, uh, 
one of the things that I struggle with, and I, this is just an ask from me to you guys that are managing these databases is, um, you know, uh, I have a lot of people that are up and coming in, in the EMS world. And I know we always struggle to get them to embrace the data and we get them, you know, to embrace, you know, to embrace research. Um, and some low hanging fruit is certainly available, I think, from the cube and from the system. And, um, you know, just even looking at little things like, uh, you know, again, the, the seasonal, um, variations in motorcycle crashes, for example. Um, or maybe it's ATVs. And, you know, I, I think that the, the basis of data in, in, you know, somebody recording what is factually happening is, is what really gives rise to these grant programs. And, you know, we're trying to solve a problem and we can't really solve the problem unless it's clearly defined by the data. And, and, and I think that's critical about what y'all do. Um, and, and again, getting people so that they, I know there's some tutorial stuff that's on there, but in the, in the future, more, you know, more things that are geared towards uh, maybe even a lesson plan created for, um, you know, for a paramedic school that can be handed off to, uh, an instructor group, um, you know, that's pre done where it shows them, you know, how to get into the cube, how to do this stuff, how to, how to look for something as a project. You know, and just, um, you know, I, I call it the McDonald's phenomena. You know, we feed them a happy meal when they're in school and then they buy the Big Mac when they're an adult. So um, so if we can feed them this stuff while they're in paramedic school or ENT school, get them excited about embracing the data, then when they're adults, they will. That, that's a great recommendation. We've actually done a lot of uh, I've had a lot of discussions regarding that. Um, a very topic and how can we how can we best uh, work with and harmonize with the educators right that are bringing on the bringing up the new folks and helping them to understand the incredible value of of, of all they do every uh, every day to document the clinical care they provide yeah thank you for that it's very helpful and you know the last thing I would say in closing is that again another reason why the the information that you guys are collecting in the databases that you're managing is absolutely critical is that uh, you know we've had a lot of discussion about workforce right and everybody's talking about these ambulance deserts and how nobody's coming to the profession and um you know, and, and I would tell you that, you know, NEMT has done some exhaustive research in this and it's not, it's not just about the money. Um, and really what you'll find is that a money has almost an equal standing as bad management. And, um, and one of the things that you hear about when you drill down into, okay, well, what's, what's really bad management. And, and that is people just not telling people they're doing a good job. And it's one thing to tell people, um, yeah, you do a great job and, you know, glad hand them and back slap them and baby kiss them. But uh, it's another thing to come to them and say, wow, you know, you've got 100 uh, percent compliance with giving aspirin to STEMIs. You're doing a great job on this. This is making a huge impact. Um, so having that data available to frontline supervisors where, you know, they're not just coming and blowing smoke up an employee, but saying, look, at your, your numbers are fantastic. You're making a difference in patient outcomes and patient care. And, and really, that kind of feeds to what the next generation really wants is they want to know that the time that they spend in an organization, that they're making a difference. And the only way to really prove that to them um, because they're going to be skeptical about somebody that's just, you know, telling them they do a great job because they have to uh, versus somebody that gets a chance to see the data and and see that they really are making a difference. And, and that's what's going to keep people and retain people in EMS. That's a great. Very well said. Great point. Yeah. Someone asked if there would be a recording of this available, and it will be available on our website. Chris Hoffman just posted a link to where you can find that, uh, hopefully by later in the week. 
if you want to share this training with anyone. And then I also listed my email, or you can always create a help desk ticket if you're interested in accessing NEMSYS data, either through the cube, which um, Chief Evans spoke about, or any of our dashboards, or we can um, pull data that you're looking for as well. Reach out to us and we'd be happy to, to help you if you're interested in using some of that for your grant. So thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you again, um, Chief Evans, for sharing your experience and your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. All right. Good luck. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.